It is August 18th, 2020. I'm Gabriel Huddleston, and this is Where the Battle Runs Thick. Today, I want to talk about fear. In the book of 1 John, and I am paraphrasing, but the apostle writes something to the effect of perfect love casts out fear. We're familiar with that phrase. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears has not been perfected in love. And there's this basic premise that we see presented here that fear grows out of this fear of judgment. It grows out of guilt. And perfect love, the love of Christ, knowing the love of God, is the antidote to that fear. It's the antidote to that that guilt, that sense of judgment, because our guilt has been covered. We now stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and we have nothing to fear as far as judgment is concerned. Well, as far as anything is concerned, really. But I would like to make some observations about our culture today and point out what I am seeing as a common thread in, in the world that we live in. Fear is a controlling force for anyone and everyone. That is something that we have to fight against as Christians. But what is fear causing in our world today? I'd like to posit a couple of examples. Number one, I'd like to talk a little bit about police brutality, which I do believe is a real problem that needs to be addressed. I think part of the reason for that is I'm sure there's bad training. There's certainly bad worldview. We have exalted the state as God, and that leads to over-empowering the state. And there's a lot more. There are many other worldview considerations we could look at when it comes to police brutality. And just as a clarification, I am not advocating the mob rule, defund the police, leftist, Black Lives Matter garbage. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying there is a real problem with police brutality. There is a real problem with the police state that is a reality in America. One, just one reason that I would like to suggest for that is this issue of fear. Recently in Phoenix, a story came out about a man who was at, a, at his girlfriend's apartment and they were playing video games and making dinner or whatever it was. I'm just going off of my memory of the story from, from the bit that I've read about it. And the, the neighboring apartment dweller called the police because it was late and he was trying to get sleep and these people were waking him up and the police, the dispatcher asked, does it sound like there's something violent happening? And the man responded, well, you know, if that's what it takes to get somebody out here quickly, then I'll say it sounds like something violent's happening. And long story short, the police show up and start pounding on the door in the middle of the night and the man grabs his gun and goes to the door, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. That is something that, I mean, I would do. If someone's pounding on my door in the middle of the night, I'm going to get my gun and go to the door and check, check on that noise. And long story short, the police shot him to death because he, quote unquote, pulled the gun on them. But this, this is clearly not a man who's out to kill cops. This is a man who's enjoying an evening with his girlfriend playing Crash Bandicoot And it goes from having some fun to getting shot dead in a matter of of seconds. That is wrong. From my understanding of the event, that is, is completely wrong, and those officers should be held accountable for murder. Now, I recognize that there are decisions, to quote Bourne, to quote the Bourne movies, decisions made in real time are never perfect. And there is a margin of error. Sometimes you're going to make the wrong judgment call. But here's where we drill down to the foundational issue, the fear that I want to talk about. A Christian worldview has the perspective that says, I fear God. I am reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, and I live to please God, and I die to please God. I would rather lay down my life than take an innocent life. I would rather run the risk of getting shot by a crook than play it safe and murder an innocent man. That is what the Christian worldview would lead to. 
we consider others more important than ourselves, like Christ did when he laid down his life on the cross for the lives of others, who, in the case of Christ, by the way, when he lays down his life, he's laying down his life for guilty people who deserve to die. And while that does describe all of us before the judgment seat of God, unless we have repented and believed and submitted ourselves to Jesus Christ, from a civil government standpoint, that does not apply to everyone. Not everyone deserves to be executed by the police. And this man, it seems, was one of those cases. So my point is, the Christian worldview leads to, I am willing to die for the innocent. Especially if you're going to put yourself in a position of authority, like a police officer, you do have, you are called to a higher level of accountability. You voluntarily chose a line of work where you knew you would risk your life. The only correct way to walk into that line of work is to say, I am risking my life for the protection of the innocent. If it comes down to it, I will err on the side of giving my life rather than erring on the side of taking innocent life. That's essential to a Christian understanding of that kind of position. And while we're, while we're mentioning this, it's also worth bearing in mind that any Christian who's going to carry a gun or who's going to take martial arts classes or anything else like that, that same worldview needs to be operative in our hearts. Christian Christians, and specifically Christian men, should be arming themselves. They should be training. They should be prepared to defend the innocent. But they also have to be operating from this Christian worldview, which says, I lay down my life for the innocent, for the weak. It's not a matter of my life is the highest value. So we see, however, how fear comes into play. Is it wrong for a police officer to go to work hoping to come home at the end of the day? Of course not. Of course not. And we should all hope that he gets to come home at the end of the day. However, he cannot let that be his operative compass, his guiding moral truth system. I'll do whatever it takes to get home at the end of the day. So where do, so is, is fear a factor for that police officer, for that, that split-second decision to go ahead and shoot the guy? Is that fear of, I might not live through this day, an operative factor? And how much of that fear is rooted in guilt? It's, of course, I, I don't know the guy. I haven't talked to him. I'm just saying, we look at this biblical principle. Fear involves punishment. We have this guilt issue that has to be dealt with before you can be fearless. Once you've been forgiven, you can be fearless. But until you're forgiven, you have that knowledge in your heart. You're guilty. And therefore, you're afraid to die. Okay, so there's that. There's the police brutality issue. I'd like to apply it to the COVID issue. We see a national panic over a disease that has a 99% plus survival rate. Because, because life... The biblical worldview honors life. The biblical worldview gives value and meaning to life. But now, we see life being exalted beyond its proper place of value. To where, I'll give up anything. I'll give up liberty. If we could just save one life. Okay, well, let's apply some Christian worldview to that statement. If you save one life, you are saving that one life temporarily. 100% of people die. That doesn't mean we should be heartless or careless about life. But it does mean that we need to recognize we live in a fallen world. Every day is a day full of risk assessments. I, I am rubbed the wrong way by the whole treatment of quote-unquote essential workers as heroes. I am a quote-unquote essential worker. I work in the water industry in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. Okay, Water is a pretty essential thing down here. But given that truth... It still drives me crazy being this whole, you guys are heroes, you go to the front lines and you face death. No, no. The front lines, I, f I face more danger from working in 116 degree heat, operating heavy machinery, and probably just simply driving to and from work and to and from job sites. I face a, a significantly higher risk of death or injury from all of those things than I face from COVID. The odds of me dying from COVID are, are astronomically low. Let's just be real when we talk about this. Let's be honest. Okay, there are, 
there are, I don't, I'm estimating, what, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other dads out there who would love to be heroes and just go to work and continue with their daily jobs and provide for their families. That's not heroism. That is basic manly and Christian duty. And it's shameful that these men are not being allowed to work. So anyway, setting that rant aside, we see the fear of COVID having just incredible power, sway over an entire culture. People petrified, going to Walmart, wearing masks and gloves and goggles, lest they catch this deadly disease. The media reports on anybody, anybody who catches COVID, it's an absolute travesty. Even if they basically have a mild cold, it's still just an absolute travesty because they caught COVID. Oh, it's COVID. Yeah, this is life in a fallen world. We face death. We face risk. Why are we so afraid to die? Well, here's one reason why. Because we're guilty. A foundational reason why. Scripture tells us this. Fear involves punishment. And we at root know we are guilty. And death involves going before a holy God. And we're not ready to do that. We are not ready to do that. And therefore, we're afraid. And since we're afraid, we are ready and willing to be ruled. We're ready and willing to be ruled by a government. who Maybe maybe they can save us. They can be our savior. They can't save us from our guilt, but maybe they can save us from death. Or they'll try to save us from our guilt, too, because we have our our penance. We can can, uh, repent, scrape, and grovel for our white privilege or our uh, fill-in-the-blank, whatever the the latest demands are. You know, if I wear my Black Lives Matter t-shirt and kneel at the football game, maybe that'll atone for my guilt. If I give away enough money, maybe that'll atone for my guilt. If I apologize at this high-profile event for X thing that my ancestor did in history, maybe that will atone for my guilt. And so we have a presentation of atonement. You can be forgiven. And we have, we turn to the government for that. We turn to the political structure for that, for our atonement. And then we turn to the government for our salvation from death. Sin and death, the two enemies. Save us, government. Save us. But they can't. They can't. No matter how many lockdowns they put you under, no matter how many masks they force you to wear, they will not be able to save you from the consequences of sin. Nor will they be able to absolve you of your sin. In fact, in their efforts to do so, all they will do is cause you more health risk and they will take away your liberty. And they will burden you with more guilt. There is no salvation in any other name other than the name of Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can deliver us from sin and from death. This underlines our need for the gospel. That is what our culture and our nation need so desperately. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ because only there is there an answer to fear. Only when we become fearless by knowing Christ can we then face death and face sin, and face the consequences of the curse without fear. Only then can we stand up like free men and refuse to be bought by promises of temporary safety if we would just wear a mask. Only then are we really ready to make decisions about what are wise risks and what are foolish risks. You know, they throw out the whole, you might kill grandma if you go to the store without a mask. How many flu seasons have you gone to the store without a mask on? And potentially infected someone's grandmother. I'm not meaning that we should be flippant about life. And especially about those who are at high risk from things like COVID. We should be careful. We should be thoughtful. But we also should acknowledge we live in a fallen world. Everyone is going to die. The government cannot save us from sin or from death. Which is the consequence of sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that. And so there is a huge opportunity for the church to rise up and to preach a fearless gospel to a fearful world. There is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. You can be forgiven of your sin. And once you're forgiven of your sin, you don't need to be afraid of death. And if you're not afraid of death, you don't need to be afraid of COVID. And if you're not afraid of COVID, then you can see straight and you can face the political climate that we're in today and make some honest judgment calls. And you can stand up like a free man, free in Christ, and speak the truth of God's word to the world around us. Whatever that looks like for you. Maybe you do wear masks. Okay, fine. But don't wear masks from fear. Come to Jesus. Be set free from your fear. 
from your guilt. And then go forth and make decisions that please him. Make decisions by faith. One more note. This emphasizes the utter ridiculousness of the evolutionary hypothesis. We all have this sense of the transcendent, of the eternal. We all fear death. We all mourn the loss of loved ones. We all have a sense of guilt. People who don't have guilt, we call them sociopaths. But if we were going to be good evolutionists, people who didn't have guilt, we would hold up as the next step in the progression of human evolution. Because let's be honest, if the material world is all that there is, I don't want to feel guilt. I don't want to feel shame. I don't want to fear death. And I don't want to mourn the loss of loved ones. If this life, this reality is all that there is, why in the world would we evolve to mourn and to be heartbroken and depressed when a loved one dies? Why would we evolve to fear the ultimate eventuality of death? Why would we not evolve to simply not care, to enjoy life while we have it, and then turn to worm food without a peep? Who cares? You had your hand in life, and you've been dealt out. Congrats. You've run the race of all dust. Why do we care? We care because there is more to this life. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, if I find in myself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, maybe that's because I was made for something beyond this world. The reality of guilt, the reality of fear of death, emphasizes and underlines the biblical truth and reality that God is real, that sin is real, that we do face the prospect of standing before a holy judge. And there's only one answer to that reality, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. So come, come to the cross, come and be made fearless by the blood of the Lamb. There is no other name by which we may be saved, saved from sin, saved from death. He rose, he conquered death, and in so doing proved that his sacrifice was a pleasing sacrifice to the judge of all the earth. And now, God the Father has made Jesus Christ the judge of all the earth. Come, be clothed in his robes, and stand before him justified and without fear. Until next time, I'm Gabriel Huddleston, and this is Where the Battle Runs Thick.